Uh, we're thrilled to welcome you here online and in person for this event on what we're calling uh, the foreign policy of technology. Um, and I'll just say a couple of words and then get right to my guests who we're just delighted to have with us today. Um, as you all know, technology is at the heart of uh, the new economic policy. We have a new industrial policy in the US uh, committing tens of billions of dollars in subsidies for semiconductors and clean technology and broadband uh, and so on. And it's at the center of our national security policy. Um, the national security strategy has technology on almost every page. Uh, we're coordinating new export controls. Um, it's in the news almost every day. Um, but essential to this uh, is of course diplomacy and working with our allies and others um, to uh, make sure that um, there are rules and that there's coordination. And so we're extremely lucky in the US to have a new office at the State Department and a leader who is going to lead on these efforts. And we have him here today, and as well as David Ignatius, who has been thinking more deeply about these issues uh, than anyone really. So um, we're, I'm gonna introduce them and then we'll just go right to questions. And I have to look at my notes because their resumes are so impressive that I could not possibly memorize them. So Ambassador Nate Fick is the inaugural US ambassador at large for cyberspace and digital policy. He was CEO of a cybersecurity software company, operating partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, working with management teams to build technology businesses. He also served a stint as CEO of the Center for New American Security. Uh, David Ignatius is, as you know, foreign affairs columnist for the Washington Post. He is the recipient of numerous honors, too numerous to list here, including the Legion of Honor from the French Republic and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Committee for Foreign Journalism. He has written 11 spy novels. And most important, he is a member of the board of the German Marshall Fund. So I'm just going to open it up. I'm just going to throw you guys some questions uh, to start out and just let you set the stage. And I'm gonna start with uh, Ambassador Fick and just ask you, you, you're starting this new bureau. You've been at the State Department a little while. Tell us about your major priorities and also your surprises. Sure, uh, thank you, Karen, so much. And thanks to GMF. It's a, it is a thrill to be here uh, with everyone. I'm so glad to have a, a crowd in person in addition to online. I'm still in that phase where it feels really good to be back with groups of people in person. Uh, David, a pleasure to be with you as always. Um, so in starting this new bureau, uh, may maybe I can just step through um, a little bit of uh, my point of view and, and uh, some framework. So I bring three philosophical principles to what we're trying to do in establishing this organization at the department. Uh, the first is a, a deep, visceral, personal belief in the intrinsic value of diplomacy. Uh, I was a Marine officer right out of college. I, I led one of the first American units in Afghanistan in 2001, one of the first in Iraq in 2003. My 20s, and in many, way, many ways, my, my professional life were defined by failures of diplomacy. Uh, and I, I believe strongly that uh, diplomacy ought to be, must be, the nation's tool of first resort. So uh, strengthening the institution of the State Department uh, is essential. I worked for General Jim Mattis twice. He famously said at one point, if you don't fund the State Department fully, you have to buy more ammo. So uh, we need a strong State Department uh, and strong diplomatic tools in the United States. Um, the second principle is just the simple proposition that ch technology is changing every aspect of our lives. It's changing how my kids learn, how my parents access healthcare. It changed how I ran my business, uh, and it's changing every aspect of our foreign policy. It's cross-cutting. It's not a vertical. It affects everything. And the third principle is uh, it is intrinsically transnational. There is nothing, there's very little that any one of us can do alone. I don't care how big and powerful you are. So uh, this really fundamentally is about building coalitions and partnerships of uh, like-minded uh, nations. It is intrinsically multi-stakeholder. It means bringing companies in. So that's the philosophy. Um, in terms of priorities, we're building a new entity inside a big bureaucracy. And it's not a criticism of the State Department to say that big bureaucracies are very good at killing new things in their midst. Uh, and so we have to 
uh, first and foremost, build this new institution. And I think fundamentally, first and foremost, that means uh, attracting great people uh, and rewarding them for service in the area of tech diplomacy. This has to be viewed as an important uh, path, uh, a path with impact and a path with career rewards if we are going to continue to attract great members of the civil service and the foreign service to do this work. So first is build the bureau. Second is reassert the State Department's rightful place in the interagency process on technology issues. Uh, I built a business, interacted with the government occasionally, and never interacted with the State Department. Uh, Homeland Security is at the table on these issues. DOD is at the table, the NSC. It's, again, not to denigrate the good work that was happening at the department over a long period of time, but it wasn't coordinated, it wasn't integrated, it wasn't elevated and led at a senior level. Uh, that put the department at the table. So it's important to have diplomacy at the table in policy formulation. And then third, now finally we get out into the world. Third, we need to we need to strengthen American foreign policy on technology topics. And I think fundamentally that means uh, sustaining American advantage and like-minded advantage in areas where we have strong technology uh, leads. It means recapturing our leads in the places where we've lost them. Uh, and it means closing off pathways to advantage for adversaries and competitors. That's great. Thank you. And D David, I, I feel as though um, this new cyber bureau was almost created in response to some of the alarms you've been raising in your columns. You were writing about what was happening at the UN, what Russia and China have been up to in terms of internet governance. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of all that? So I, I'd love to give you a little bit of the of the, of the backstory. Um, let me just say first, as a GMF trustee, it's wonderful to see this room filled. Uh, you know, we'd love to, to fill the seats. And uh, it's nice to know, Nate, that you're a real draw for GMF. We're gonna have you back. Uh, so I, I have been uh, writing about, about this for a while. Back in 2020, when the Russians succeeded with almost no notice in the United States in getting the UN General Assembly to support their efforts to write a new uh, treaty for cyberspace to replace what was known as the Budapest Convention uh, back in 2001, which they never signed, didn't like, because it included provisions that would have limited their ability to, to restrict uh, information. I wrote the Fox has just managed to get itself elected chairman of the committee to protect the hen house. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was the extraordinary situation that, that the, the Russians seem to have the high ground uh, at, at the United Nations. Uh, a, a bit of uh, history before that, uh, there's a, a quote that's so startling, I'm going to read it to you, from a man named Andrei Krutsky, who uh, has been Vladimir Putin's key cyber advisor, um, a person who's worth just Googling his name and seeing all the things that he has said, because he's an absolutely central strategist in this campaign. Russia has been waging, waging to seize the, the high ground. He said uh, in 2016 in Moscow at a gathering called the Info Forum, where one of my friends happened to be transcribing uh, and then translating from Russian, said the following, you think we're living in 2016? No, we're living in 1948. And do you know why? Because in 1949, the Soviet Union had its first atomic bomb test. And until that moment, the Soviet Union was trying to reach agreement with President Truman to ban nuclear weapons, and the Americans were not taking us seriously. In 1949, everything changed, and they started talking to us on an equal footing. I'm warning you, we are at the verge of having something in the information arena which will allow us to talk to the Americans as equals. That's 2016. We all remember what was happening in 2016. There was a concerted, aggressive assault on our election system by Russia. Whether that's exactly what Krutsky meant, I, I can't say. But that, can, that campaign continued. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev, Medvedev, the Russian uh, number two, uh, was explicit in saying that Russia sought to displace a group called ICANN, the multi-stakeholder governance organization that oversees the, uh, the internet, uh, and instead interposed the International Telecommunications Union. 
Russians began running their candidate, uh, Rashil, uh, Rashid Ismailov, I think is his name, uh, to be the head of the ITU. There were very specific plans about how the ITU would take control from ICANN of governance, and then a series of things would happen. And at that time, I remember as a journalist writing almost obsessively about this, that our government just didn't seem to be paying attention. And I'm happy to say that with the new administration, uh, Secretary Blinken decided he was going to start fighting in these trenches. These UN bodies, like the ITU, are so obscure. And for a couple generations, we just let the fights in those standard-setting bodies go to the Russians, the Chinese, and their allies. We just didn't pay sufficient attention. And Nate's presence here in his job is testimony to the fact that uh, Secretary Blinken and this administration decided we're going to fight back. And that's, you know, that's what, what Nate is doing. I'm sure most of you know that when the ITU elections happened last year, in part because of the Ukraine war, uh, the U.S. candidate, uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin, won overwhelmingly. And not simply that, the Russians lost in every single vote for subcommittees of the ITU. They were just shut out. Uh, and their role, their ability to manipulate the ITU, I think, is, has been radically diminished. Uh, others, uh, Chinese in particular, are continuing this effort to try to, to displace the multi-stakeholder approach uh, to the internet. Um, but I, I think the world really is awakened, and that's, that's Nate's job. Just close with, with this thought. So as long as I've been thinking and writing about this, I've been troubled by the paradox that's obvious to all of us, but it is still really haunting. When the internet first was created in the United States, the idea was that open information, a flat information space would empower freedom. It would make the world more open and better. And the paradox has been that the regime that we have now, which I'm defending, but I, I want to be honest about, about what that regime ends up looking like, has ended up empowering the governments that control information, like Russia and China, which squeeze their citizens more, and has made life harder for the countries that have open information, which are just bombarded by, by uncontrolled often vicious dis disinformation. So that paradox and solving it in a way that is not the Russian system, not the Chinese system, but a system that Nate and his colleagues are gonna help the world figure out, I think is the challenge. Well, I'll give a quick plug to our program because um, those are things we've been thinking about because I was involved in those early days of the internet and drank the Kool-Aid about the open internet bringing democracy and um, power to the powerless and voice to the voiceless. And um, so we're putting out a report, I hope next week, that will have some ideas about how to plug some of the holes in the multilateral, multi-stakeholder system to give the democracies more of a fighting chance. But I, I wanted to be able to give Nate a chance to, to well, turn to other issues, but David's put internet governance challenges so firmly on the table. And I know a lot of people think that if we're going to, to pick up on what he was talking about, the, op the weaponization of the openness of the system, some people think we have to choose that, that if we're going to be realists about the geopolitics, we have to give up the openness and the internet freedom. And I know that's not the U.S. position, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yes, I'm happy to. And, and uh, David, thanks for that um, historical context. And thanks for writing about it, because these are battles that matter. And they're so arcane that uh, many people just don't appreciate that they're happening. But uh, don't take it for granted when you get off a plane anywhere in the world and your cell phone works. That doesn't just happen. Uh, and so these, you know, these these standard setting bodies uh, matter. Um, and I, I would I would say that uh, Doreen Bogdan's, Bogdan Martin's victory in the ITU election um, is emblematic, I think, of, of, a, of a, a re engagement by the United States and hopefully a turning of the tide. Um, there are some in, in American political circles who uh, like to criticize bodies like the United Nations. Um, and I appreciate they are 
uh, messy and slow and inefficient or can be. Um, but when we step back, nature abhors a vacuum and others fill um, the, the void that we leave and, uh, and, and move those bodies in directions that are um, ultimately, you know, very fundamentally at odds with the, the technology future that I think, I think we all uh, want to see. So, um, uh, Karen, I, uh, in, in talking about internet governance, um, I would start with the proposition that um, we should not cast everything in competitive terms, actually. Um, it should not be all uh, anti-Russia or anti-China uh, because there are many uh, middle ground states around the world, um, uh, intentionally and historically unaligned states, uh, where that message doesn't resonate. And um, we need to make sure that we couch uh, all of our policies first and foremost in uh, affirmative, positive, attractive, compelling terms, um, telling a very real story about the good things uh, that technology can bring uh, in our future. Uh, that doesn't mean we ignore mitigating the risks and the, and the dangers, um, but I think we need to cast everything first and foremost in a positive, attractive, compelling vision. It's not a you're with us or against us uh, kind of scenario. Um, and we want middle ground states to align with us, but to do it for the good of their own people um, and, and to, to make the decision and articulate the decision in those terms um, to their own people. So um, you, you said um, nature of her abhors a vacuum. And I think, um, you know, David was describing a status quo where um, maybe we created an opportunity. Uh, cybersecurity, ransomware, you know, are two areas where I think people were feeling like the system isn't working, some of these non-aligned countries. Um, uh, the last year of watching and participating in what's going on in Ukraine and, and with Russia, like, are there, has that changed the game? Are there lessons we're learning? I mean, in addition to all the things the administration is doing internally to get organized on cybersecurity, but I wonder if we could, maybe we can turn to that next, but let's talk about Ukraine a little bit because it's been such a dramatic um, situation, especially in terms of uh, cybersecurity. So David, I don't know if you wanna start there. I just was in Ukraine in December um, talking with Ukrainian technologists, uh, interviewing members of the Ukrainian military who work uh, closely with our technology companies to access the network of commercial satellites that allows their soldiers on the ground, their people on the ground to um, have broadband connectivity. Uh, that allows them to receive information of every kind, including targeting information. Um, just a couple of points. Um, first, the sophistication of, the, of our Ukrainian partners in technology is stunning. Uh, as, as one of them said to me, a uh, person serving in the military, but working with um, American companies, in these projects, we're gonna be selling software to you by the time this war is over. And I have a feeling that's right because they're just so proficient. They're learning so fast. Uh, their, their troops with little handheld tablet, uh, ATAC computers are, are doing astonishing things. Um, the Russians are trying, the Russians would love, they see the, this network of commercial satellites that they would like to be able to buy imagery that they could use for similar uh, targeting, uh, they have been unable to make that work. They simply don't have the flexibility. So, um, you know, a, a task that I, I know Nate is going to focus on in the future is the satellite architecture, commercial satellite architecture, that's going to need protection. Russia and China are not idiots. That they, they see what's happening, and they're gonna make every effort, uh, either through regulation uh, or through, um, through weapon systems, visible and not visible, to, to, to bring this architecture down. And I, I, I know you'll wanna stay focused on the, on the diplomatic uh, part of that. Um, 
know, I'll, I'll t- turn it over there, I think, to Nate, because I'd be interested in the specifics of, of what you're what you're trying to do. But you know, the 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 way in which this this war turns on technology, it turns on two things. The bravery of Ukrainian citizens, as General Milley likes to say, in war, the moral is to the physical as three is to one. It's my favorite Milley quoting Napoleon. Um, so it, it turns on the bravery of the Ukrainians, but it, it turns secondarily on the, this incredible technology that we're helping them to use. So just to be very clear, uh, one of our top priorities at the department is ensuring that Russia's invasion of Ukraine results in a strategic defeat for Russia, full stop. So uh, I've been all over Central and Eastern Europe and will be again shortly. And it is something that we're spending uh, an enormous amount of energy on. Uh, I agree with David. Um, I think that uh, the last year has, has, has fundamentally changed um, how government and the private sector collaborate on uh, cybersecurity issues, fundamentally. Um, when I was a cybersecurity CEO, public-private partnership was, uh, was a feel-good buzz term. Uh, it generally meant I shared my data with the government, the government classified it, and I got nothing back. Uh, that is emphatically no longer the case. And uh, I'll give three examples um, where, where I think uh, technology has been a game changer in Ukraine. Uh, and where we should think about other places where uh, you can imagine repeating some of these lessons in anticipation of uh, a future geopolitical contest. Um, the first is uh, migration of Ukrainian government enterprises to the cloud before the invasion. Uh, that single act um, uh, enabled continuity of government uh, in Ukraine, enabled the Ukrainian government to continue delivering services to its people uh, after the, after the Russian invasion. And, uh, it is a, it is a testimony to the power of, uh, of a cloud enabled future. Um, second, uh, satellite communications, uh, which, which David has, has talked about. And this is, uh, it changes the game in terms of the relationship between authoritarian governments and their people, uh, or citizens in, in conflict zones. Uh, in terms of access to information. It matters not only in Ukraine, but also in Iran. It matters in North Korea. Uh, it matters in Taiwan. Uh, we could go right down the list. Uh, and then third, getting kind of to the heart of public-private collaboration, uh, people have wondered um, why Russian cyber attacks seem not to have been effective or as effective uh, in Ukraine uh, or in, in Europe. Um, and in Ukraine, one of the reasons is that uh, Microsoft and others were able to push updates at scale uh, in near real time based on collaboration with the US intelligence community uh, that allowed them to blunt these attacks. It's not that the attacks weren't happening, it's that they weren't being effective. Um, so just sticking with this theme, um, I wanna bring up Huawei, which is in the news right now, and I think has been a diplomatic success, at least that appears from the outside, but open it up to either of you to reflect on that. Just uh, underline what uh, what Nate said about the um, public-private partnerships and their importance um, in protecting Ukraine, but really um, Europe and the world uh, from, from Russian attacks. Um, if you need convincing on this, just uh, put in your search box, Microsoft and Ukraine, and download the report that Brad Smith, the Microsoft president, helped organize that summarizes what they did in the, in the hours immediately before and after the Russian invasion. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, as, as Nate says, it's something that a few years ago in the aftermath of Edward Snowden, you couldn't have imagined that degree of cooperation between uh, the U.S. and allied governments uh, and private companies. And, and it's been just an absolutely um, essential piece of, of, of what's happened. On Huawei, what is striking to me is, um, as with this Russian-Chinese effort to rewrite the rules for internet governments, governance, it, it seemed almost a fight that we had given up. That Huawei was 
already capturing the commanding heights on 5G. It was over. Uh, you know, we were trying to mitigate the damage. Um, and then people began to get serious. Uh, the, the British, I think, did an extraordinary job. GCHQ has a public facing cybersecurity organization that began to push uh, declassified versions of, of the most uh, sensitive information about Huawei, about why Huawei was dangerous, about just how poorly put together it was. I mean, you read this stuff and you thought, geez, maybe we should encourage people to get Huawei. It's the easiest uh, software in the world to hack. But, but this began, I think, to convince European governments um, the degree to which they were locking themselves into Huawei was a mistake. So, Karen, I, I, um, on that front, I'm struck by how different the picture looks today, two years, three years later, from from what it looked before, when it seemed like basically lost lost cause was over. Uh, Huawei had already won. Nate, yeah, yeah. So this is a this is a fascinating global battleground, right? Um, uh, connecting people uh, to the internet broadly using, and, and all of the architecture that goes along with that from cables to satellites, to wireless networks, to data centers. Um, you have a, a, a global competitive landscape that used to be pretty diverse. And, uh, and now after a couple decades of, of uh, Chinese government subsidization of Huawei uh, that allowed Huawei to undercut Western bids compressed R and D budgets and in, in, in other, I shouldn't say Western, um, because they're, they're, there were very big, uh, successful, uh, Asian companies in this mix too, but non, non Chinese competitors compressed their R and D budgets, gradually drove consolidation. Uh, many of the businesses went out of business and, and now you're left with, you know, Huawei and ZTE on one side, uh, Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung on the other. And, uh, I would just say, you know, right at the outset, um, I, I, I've said this to my European and, and Asian counterparts re repeatedly, um, send me around the world in an Ericsson t-shirt and a Nokia hat. That's fine. This is not about, uh, advancing a narrow American economic self-interest. This is first and foremost about trusted connectivity, uh, the world over. And, uh, just a, a few points on it. Um, first, I, I do think we have to, to look beyond just wireless connectivity, uh, the, the, the next frontier of Huawei competition is probably in the data center. So, um, you know, there, there are some good examples in Europe of bans on Huawei wireless connectivity. <clears throat> uh, and then at the same time, uh, local governments inside countries trumpeting uh, Huawei uh, coming into data centers because of uh, the job opportunities that it creates. And so the, the left hand and the right hand aren't talking and we need to help kind of connect those dots. So there, there's that's an element of this. Um, looking forward, um, I, I agree that that the uh, the look the five G fight is far from over. Um, I'm glad the United States and others have reengaged around the world on this, uh, and, and we have almost literally everywhere. Um, one of the challenges here is financing mechanisms. So uh, Huawei comes into a into a tender with I'll just make up some numbers. Uh, you know, a hundred million dollar bid. Uh, the competitor, the the trusted competitor, comes in with a three or four hundred million dollar bid. Um, and so, I think what we're missing, one of the things we're missing, is that competitive financing mechanism uh, to help close the gap. Uh, and and I think there's, I believe there's a, a geopolitical case to make for us to pay some price to come up with that mechanism. And we're and we are working on it. Um, but looking forward, um, you know, let's let's look at six G and and there's a yeah. How do we avoid getting five G uh, again? You know, this is one of those fight from behind examples that I mentioned at the outset. Uh, in places where we already have an advantage, how do we not take our eye off that ball? How do we sustain the advantage? And and how do we head off the pathway to advantage for our competitors? And one of the really interesting possibilities with six G is not only more bandwidth and lower latency and all of the things that enables, you know, remote surgery and all kinds of, you know, uh, technologies where, where latency will literally kill. Um, but imagine a, a, a global communications protocol uh, that allows for seamless communication across geographies, but married to um, nation specific um, uh, controls so that you can actually use the architecture to meet some of the 
requirements of national sovereignty, for instance, um, and, and begin to get past uh, some of the obstacles, current obstacles, particularly between the United States and Europe, and uh, and, and use use technology to help us get there instead of uh, instead of politics. Great. Um, so, David, you've written about how uh, about interviewing Henry Kissinger, and that his uh, call to action. Um, alarm bell is around AI, that he has become convinced that this is the challenge of our time. Can you scare us all a little bit with that story? Well, um, I wish I could do a, a convincing Kissinger invitation. I won't try. But uh, for a, a forum uh, at the Washington National Cathedral, uh, in honor of my parents, I, on the subject of AI, uh, I interviewed Kissinger. Uh, went up to New York to his offices there. Uh, Kissinger, as you may know, has gotten interested to the point of obsession late in life. He's now 99, I think, with AI. And he has written a book with Eric Schmidt, which I commend to everyone called The Future of AI. There's a third author, Eric Huttenlocker, who's famous MIT um, uh, professor. Uh, he also wrote an extraordinary article for the Atlantic magazine. Again, if you haven't read it, check it out, called uh, AI and the End of the Age of Reason. Uh, so Kissinger's argument basically is that uh, he, as a person who spent his much of his career thinking about nuclear weapons, he now realizes that control of nuclear weapons per se is not the issue that it's controlling the AI systems that will drive the deployment of nuclear and all other weapons that people need to think about. And that just as uh, an AI system, you know, uh, AlphaGo uh, or DeepMind in chess uh, can do through machine learning, uh, assess every move that's ever been made by a human being, and then overlay on top of that every move that might be made that human beings never thought of and come up with strategies that are, that are unbeatable in chess and go. So too in warfare will AI systems applied to the problem, the challenge of overcoming the adversary, think of strategies, think of ways to use the weapons that no human being ever thought of or would and we'll have a, a diabolical kind of warfare. That's what Kissinger's thinking about at the end of his life. So he says, what's, what we need is a dialogue between the two AI superpowers, uh, Russia and, and China, uh, not Russia and China, the United States and China, to, to, to begin to evolve a language to talk about this. I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I said this recently to our ambassador to China, Nick Burns, um, it's something that Chinese refuse to talk about nuclear weapons uh, until they achieve parity. But I, this is something that for various reasons, I think they might be willing to talk about. So that's, that's the Kissinger view. Um, and it's worth, if you're interested in this, um, looking at what he, what he says, it's, it's, it's surprising. You, you know, for if, if you have a caricature view of Kissinger, seeing him as an AI savant, it's a surprise. Yeah, definitely. So I know that AI is to some degree on your plate, although you share it with other agencies, and that uh, some of the work that's going on at the OECD in terms of guardrails and ethical approaches to AI, um, is that right? Yes. Uh, so I think uh, ChatGPT has done us all a tremendous service in bringing this to the forefront and making it tangible for citizens. Um, I was actually at an OECD meeting in Spain recently and used ChatGPT to write my talking points um, and compared them with the comments that I got through the department. Uh, and I'll tell you, they were qualitatively close enough to be scary. So uh, there's an internal use case, but, but we won't spend time on that. Um, I think that uh, um, there's a, a, a point to make about AI uh, and other bleeding edge emerging technologies. I would put advanced computing in this category, biotechnologies in this category. Um, we are early enough in the evolution uh, that we're still in a, a norm setting phase. Um, and 
I would urge um, the United States and 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 its uh, like-minded partners to be conscious of setting norms that we're going to be uh, that we're willing to live by uh, when the technologies are widely proliferated because they will be and they will be more quickly than we think. Um, look at again, ChatGPT is doing us a favor just in in driving the point home in a way that people can understand it. Uh, but this is faster user adoption uh, than than any other uh, any other um, application in history, and I don't think that's an aberration. I think it's a new normal. Um, so the norm setting exercise really matters. And and to your point about uh, the OECD, um, Karen, and I, I defer to you on this since you're a former ambassador to the OECD and know more about it uh, than any of us. Um, but there is a, a body within the OECD called the Global Partnership on AI, GPA, and um, these bodies really matter. I would put them in that in that category of somewhat arcane, standard, and enormous setting organizations where uh, the United States and, and others need to be deeply engaged now. And um, there's a tension worth talking about, which is, or at least acknowledging, which is the way that um, legitimacy and efficacy can sometimes be um, opposing forces. So the bigger these bodies get, the more legitimacy they have, and the bigger they get, the harder it is to keep them um, effective. And so I don't have, I'm not sure anyone has an answer to that challenge, but it's something that we, uh, that we might acknowledge. Yeah. You're, you're making, reminding me when I would come back from being ambassador and um, sometimes I would sit with the um, other multilateral ambassadors, most of whom were in the UN system, and I would go back to my post feeling really lucky that I had to deal with a much smaller number of countries. Yeah, but they had more legitimacy. They were not, you know, the rich com- countries club. And, and that's my, th- I'm going to ask one more question. And then those of you in the room, we're only taking live questions. So those of you in the room, if you could think about your questions, because after this, I'll turn to you. But I did want to turn to this question of norm setting and what we're doing with our allies uh, in, the, in the tech space. Um, and and maybe I'll start with David. There's been a lot of a lot of friction, maybe too strong a word, with the Europeans over uh, digital taxes, over uh, platform regulation. Now the Buy American provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. I you know uh, the Huawei story. I think we tell is a good one uh, about working with the Europeans. But I wonder what your thoughts are about how we get to a similar place with our closest allies and then you know working out from there on these topics just just briefly because Nate's thoughts on this I think will be much more um, uh, useful to the to the audience um, ideally what the United States did with the uh, inflation reduction act I hate, hate using that term but um, with the package of subsidies that are part of the Inflation Reduction Act um, it was European-like. That's the paradox. This is the kind of industrial policy that we traditionally disdained, as even as the French and others pushed ahead with it. And now we're doing it, and, and they're upset. So ideally, this should be a bridge to a dialogue to develop common standards and understandings. That uh, we we don't we, we don't want a kind of subsidy war. It's the last thing anybody would would want to see. So if we had a common framework on on these issues, as on privacy standards, uh, as on generally um, technology standards and rules, um, we'd we'd end up sometime this year next year in a very advantageous place. I mean, that's that's the opportunity. So I'm not all that unhappy to see the issue joined with the European protests, so long as we respond creatively. So I'll turn to Ambassador. Yeah, and I'll, let me just put a, a finer point on it to make sure you address a couple of issues that I, I wanna make sure we get on the table. Um, so there's been, as you well know, there's been a lot of talk of a T10, of a T20, of sort of a democracies club. I know when I was ambassador to the OECD, we use the OECD, which is the Democracies Club, to um, to create internet policy making principles in a venue that was not the UN to avoid the very challenge that David laid out. We wanted to keep it away from the Russian and the Chinese effort to impose a multilateral system on the internet. Um, but there are always tensions there because if we're dealing with 
only democracies, only the the closest in countries, we risk alienating some of those middle countries. And so that's back to your legitimacy uh, versus efficacy question. And how are you going about this? Am I visibly squirming, squirming in my seat or am I, uh, am I masking it? Um, look, the, a few, a few points here. Um, first one of, one of the uncomfortable realities of diplomacy, uh, is that sometimes, uh, your country's domestic policies don't necessarily strengthen your foreign policy. And that's a reality. The president wrote uh, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about this um, and, and called for, among other things, um, federal privacy regulation in the United States. I strongly endorse that call. It will strengthen our foreign policy. It will strengthen our trade policy. Uh, it will help us build bigger, stronger alliances. Um, so uh, th that's a, a, a reality and, um, uh, and obviously a constant um, uh, source of discussion, uh, topic of discussion with our European counterparts. Um, I think Mr. Putin has done us a favor in this regard. And, uh, if, if, you know, uh, if, if there is a silver lining, uh, to the invasion of Ukraine, it's, uh, that old adage that, that, uh, you never, never miss the opportunity afforded by a good crisis and, uh, obstacles that not long ago felt almost insurmountable, um, now feel actually surmountable with sustained diplomatic engagement. And um, I think there's a lot of work to uh, bridge the gap. Um, the, uh, the, some, of, some of the Inflation Reduction Act provisions obviously provoked a, you know, a negative reaction in Europe. And, and I've been at the table at the TTC to help figure out the path. And I'm, I'm confident we will figure out the path uh, because so much is riding on it. And uh, I think we share a vision of an end state, uh, and um, and there is a lot of constructive goodwill on both sides to get there. And there's an overriding geopolitical um, imperative to figure it out. So um, I'm I'm confident that we're going to see progress there this year. And uh, on your point about um, uh, about the OECD and and sort of the T20, the T. There, there were these calls for a long time in academia, in the think tank world. Uh, when I was a private citizen, I, I found the idea appealing of uh, establishing a T whatever of techno democracies to have a forum of capable, like-minded states um, that could uh, that could align on these issues. Um, I, I have a maybe a more nuanced uh, appreciation of the challenges of that path right now. Um, I think energy and time are zero sum. Um, we're probably better served investing that time in existing institutions rather than further seeding any um, leverage or advantage to our adversaries in existing institutions. And the OECD uh, has a forum that that I we announced uh, last month called the Global Forum on Technology, the GFT, which has the benefit of a secretariat structured around it a body that can help the work happen and be sustained. Um, and it, it's generally like-minded states, uh, but the OECD also has a kind of a mission and ethos of, of bringing in um, uh, others around the world. And I, I'd like to see us use the GFT as a body this year. Uh, let's get started. And, and uh, the topics for the GFT will, will arise from the secretariat and the member states, but um, I think biotech would be uh, would be a terrific topic to cover there. Um, issues of synthetic biology, and um, uh, and I think we're we're going to align on the agenda for the GFT in the next several months. Just so had a, a very brief uh, comment before we turn uh, to uh, the audience for questions on this issue of uh, the techno democracies. So I, I have been struck by the evolution, like. Nate, um, that idea of an alliance of techno democracies. When I when I first heard it, it, it was a article in Foreign Affairs by Jared Cohen from uh, Google that put the idea out, and it, it sounded pretty sensible. But the more you think about it, the problem is that you end up excluding countries that are 
your allies, but aren't democracies. Obvious example, UAE. Another obvious example is Singapore. I mean, Singapore isn't really a democracy, but it's sure a country that we'd like to have working with us. So I'll close with something I never forget. I, I have just become the editor of the International Herald Tribune. I'm in living in Paris, but I'm traveling to Asia where we publish. It's goodness, 2000, 2001. I go see senior minister Lee Kuan Yew, who has driven us crazy, uh, suing us every time we suggest that his son, now the prime minister, is his son, that, that there might be anything you know related in that. And he libel suits that shut us down. And so he turns to me and he says, uh, Mr. Ignatius, I hate what you write about us. But I have realized that for Singapore to grow, we need to have access to the information that you and other international communications media you know, through the internet provide. So, you know, I, I have decided that we, we have to lower these barriers for Singapore to have a future. And I thought, you know, it's true. Lee Kuan Yew really is the smartest guy in the world. I mean, that's, um, so that's the right answer. And we should, we should invite uh, Lee Kuan Yew, or Singapore, not even Lee Kuan Yew anymore, but Singapore and these other countries. And I think that's the right outcome. Footnote, um, we did publish another article about his son and he did sue us. <laughs> so, uh, so much for the promise. So I will turn it to the audience, but I will do a footnote to your footnote. Um, which is, I would, I would commend to folks, uh, Christian Freeland, the um, uh, deputy prime minister now of Canada, gave a great speech at uh, our fellow think tank Brookings, talking about some of these tensions. And she laid out her view: What do we do with democracies? What do we do with with others? That is very provocative. I'm, I'm not sure I 100% agree with it, but it, she's always interesting. And then the other thing I would just say, since we talked about Henry Kissinger. One of the things he did at the OECD was create the International Energy Agency uh, in the face of OPEC and the um, oil embargo. And it may be a model. Um, and that's part of what our report is going to talk about for something like what we're, what we're talking about here, recognizing the greater need for public-private partnership today, I think, than we had then. But anyway, I, will, I now will do, as promised, turn to the audience and please wait for a mic. And then please give the um, mic back so that others can ask questions. And I think we have a question right here. Thank and please, oh, much. sorry, please state your name and affiliation. Right. You say, I'm Jurgi Katainen uh, from the Finnish Innovation Fund. I used to be a vice president of European Commission and prime minister of Finland. So thank you very much for a fascinating panel. It has been really, really good, good to hear your views. Just the first comment on... Uh, um, Inflation Reduction Act. From our perspective, it's um, slightly too protectionist. So it's not exactly what the EU is doing because our subsidies are applicable without any local content requirements for, for any, any other nation companies. But that's just a comment. And I, I'm very positive when ambassadors say that you, you, you figure out a solution to this later on this year. But um, I'd like to ask your views on data market regulation. As you probably know, the EU has started to regulate data-based market. And um, whereas AI is engine, data is the fuel. And as data is the fastest growing raw material and fuel, for businesses and, and, and societal development, we need to get a fair regulation, which levels the playing field between different sizes of companies, which incorporates the interest of individuals and societies. So I, I see that, that this is something in which the United States and Europe could cooperate very closely or should cooperate very closely, because all market regulation mirrors always the values of legislator. And, and as data is the most valuable raw material in the future, it needs to get democratic values. So just uh, your comments on, on this possible cooperation. So I, I and we agree um, with uh, the notion that, that, uh, that data is the fuel, um, that, uh, that this is um, uh, getting the free flow of data right can unlock 
enormous economic gains uh, and geopolitical power uh, and advances for citizens uh, and uh, falling into a into a balkanized world uh, with uh, some countries adhering to certain rules and other countries adhering to others feels like an own, an own goal um, in in soccer and uh, football uh, and one that's avoidable. The uh, the Japanese uh, in their uh, their chair uh, year of the of the G7 are making data free flow with trust uh, a signature initiative. So this is uh, this is much broader even than just the United States and Europe. Uh, and um, I think that again um, we we share a view of the end state, and um, uh, and there's an enormous amount of effort now underway uh, to make it to make it real. And um, I'm, I believe that we will get there if only because the alternatives are, uh, are so unpalatable. Wait, I think we have a question over here. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, Brendan Bordelon, tech policy reporter with Politico. Uh, thanks for being here and taking my question. Um, you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, obviously, that's not the only source of tension uh, with allies, particularly in Europe. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, technology export controls. The Commerce Department is obviously leading in this space. This isn't your purview, but um, there is a lot of tension, I think, uh, and maybe growing tension, depending on how far these controls go, uh, with European allies in particular about controls on the shipment of advanced technology to China. Uh, obviously, the Commerce Department's worried about security. Uh, I think the Europeans are as well, but they're also worried about the bottom line of companies like ASML. Um, there was a deal that was, I think, uh, uh, reached on Friday, but uh, there are supposed to be more controls coming down the pike. To what extent are you having conversations with the Commerce Department, the Bureau of Industry and Security about the extent of existing controls, but also, you know, future controls coming down the pike? Are you ever maybe telling them we got to reel it back a little bit? Are you hearing from allies about concerns? I guess I'm just wondering the extent to which there's any sort of crosstalk between the agencies on this and to the extent you hear from allies about these uh, controls. Sure. Uh, well, at the uh, at the table at the last TTC ministerial, um, the uh, U.S. Trade Rep, the Secretary of Commerce, and the Secretary of State were quite literally shoulder to shoulder uh, at a small table, uh, and and that I would I would extend that image that metaphor um, all the way through the way these policies are being devised and implemented. So yes, it is uh, it is a classic whole of government approach. Um, and uh, I think there's a there's a good process in place that adjudicates uh, different positions because, I mean, I think as you're alluding, there there might be uh, diplomatic priorities that are slightly different from commercial priorities, and and we have to find a way to 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 align them um, or to to package them for greatest greatest efficacy. Um, and the uh, the uh, you you talked about ASML the, the this latest round with the um, um, with the uh, Netherlands and, and Japan um, is, I think, further indication of the seriousness with which the U.S. And, and not only the U.S., but the U.S. and our allies are taking this next phase of geopolitical competition uh, with a Chinese government that continues to articulate a very different view of uh, of what a technology future should look like. We have a question over here. Hi, I'm Nicole Tisdale. Um, I am an advisor with Omidyar Networks. Um, my question is for Ambassador Fit. Um, so I worked on the Hill for a number of years um, and just finished at the National Security Council um, where we were advocating for your position and the office to be created, even though many people are like yet another silo at State Department. Um, so thank you for making us look good. Um, I wanted to just ask you during your confirmation, you talked about the idea that cyber cannot continue to be this community of other as it relates to foreign policy. And you envisioned a world where every chief of mission would have a position and have a background on basic cyber policy. I would add that our ambassadors should as well. And so I wonder as we talk about this, like how are you thinking we're gonna weave in cyber policy to some of the countries that we don't normally have those relationships, right? So the Guatemalas of the world, um, talking about countries on the, the continent of Africa, 
how are we really making this a whole of society with all of our allies, not just the ones that we have the historic uh, strategic relationships with? I think you should moderate the next panel. <laughs> Thank you for your work previously uh, and, and also for the question. Um, so I think that if, if we create a, a silo of technology competence at the State Department over the next couple of years, we will have utterly failed. Um, this is, it is a horizontal. It cuts across every aspect of our foreign policy. And so I, I envision the Bureau as a service provider organization. Um, the, the real work is happening at posts and missions around the world. It's happening on the proverbial literal front lines. Uh, and so what we're doing, um, I mean, I'll, I'll share my goal in, in that regard. Uh, my goal is that we have a basically trained cyber and digital policy staff member uh, in every mission uh, in, in the world that matters, you know, in, in, in the next couple of years, in the next two years. And so we've, we have a training course at FSI, the Foreign Service Institute, um, that is currently oversubscribed. We, we don't have enough seats. The demand signal is really high. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go speak at the, at the first, the kickoff class, integrated class. Um, and we're going we're gonna to ramp up the number of people we can push through that course, again, with the goal of having a basically trained member of the team in, in every mission in a, within a couple of years. Um, because it, it, it's, not, it's simply not the case, and I think this is embedded in your question, it's simply not the case that these topics matter uh, in Tokyo and these topics matter in Berlin. Uh, they matter everywhere because the, the, the playing field is global. The mission of connecting people uh, is global. Uh, it's ubiquitous, and so we have to we have to have this expertise everywhere. Um, and I, I will just reiterate that point that you referenced from my confirmation. I can imagine a future that's not very far off, where every credible candidate to be a chief of mission has a demonstrated capability in this area. Um, we we simply have to get there. And I'll give you one quick historical analogy. Um, in 1986, the U.S. Uh, there, there was the uh, the Goldwater Nichols Defense Reform Act, um, and it came. It arose from. Uh, I'll oversimplify, but a couple decades that included some American military failures uh, and some Israeli military successes. Um, and one of the uh, reasons behind the American failures was a lack of the ability to operate jointly. Uh, Desert One, the Desert One rescue in Iran and failed rescue in Iran in 1980 is a great example of this. And a provision of Goldwater Nichols was requiring every candidate for flag rank to have done a joint tour. So overnight, you went from having the bottom 10% of your colonels hiding in joint tours to the top 10% of your colonels actively seeking out joint tours because it was important for their promotion. Imagine a world in our diplomatic establishment where people were actually rewarded or required to acquire, demonstrate expertise in technology diplomacy in order to ascend to the highest ranks in our organization. That's what we need. That would be a big change. Um, I speak from experience. Um, I'm going to take two questions and then just leave you guys an opportunity to say a couple of words in closing, either in response to those questions or adding whatever it is that you want. Okay, we have one over here. Good morning. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my name is Gopal Ratnam. I'm a reporter for Congressional Quarterly and Roll Call. Nice to meet you, Ambassador. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks of closing off the pathways to advantage for adversaries. Now, in the, in the current administration, there's been a series of steps taken to cut off exports of high-tech chips and other technologies to China. Now there's a new panel in Congress looking at the strategic competition with China. And some lawmakers have been saying that in addition to cutting off the technology flow, there also needs to be an effort to cut off supply of capital, American capital, startup capital going to China. And uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan has mentioned that they are looking into that. So I want to ask you, is that a path we should go down? Are there pros and cons of making sure that American capital doesn't flow to, for example, high-tech startups in uh, China, especially in the area of artificial intelligence? And if, if you have a recommendation on that for the administration. Thank Let's you. Let's take one more question. We have one over here. 
right here. Hi, Jennifer Brody with Access Now. Thanks so much for this great discussion today. Um, my question is in regards to the Freedom Online Coalition. We were excited to see the US take over the, the chairship in January. So was curious to learn what the United States has planned in terms of combating surveillance technologies like NSO, NSO Group and also combating internet shutdowns. Thank you, Jennifer. I didn't have time to ask that question. So why don't I just let you each say your closing remarks. Do you wanna start, Nate, and then David? Sure. And I'll, I'll try to, I'll incorporate um, a bit here. Um, so with regard to investment, um, it's, uh, it's I, I will comment based on my history. Uh, I spent a decade at a venture capital firm um, and both on the inbound and outbound side, uh, we ought to acknowledge that this is a real issue, that uh, investment in uh, of, of American dollars in, in Chinese startups is an issue. And similarly, Chinese LP money in American funds uh, investing in US companies is likewise an issue because that money often comes with strings attached, requiring partnerships, technology access, and other things. So this is uh, it is a real issue. I don't think it's a, a boogeyman. Uh, and I'm glad that it's now getting the attention that it deserves. Uh, and I think we're going to see more on this topic. Um, on the Freedom Online Coalition, and uh, particularly on, uh, on, on both uh, commercial surveillance technologies and, and um, uh, internet shutdowns. Um, so I had the one of one of the more gratifying moments uh, of the last several months for me was going to Ethiopia and delivering uh, a very strong point of view uh, to the Ethiopian government on its internet shutdown policies in the context of uh, the war in the north. And um, I think it's a uh, the the principle of uh, open access uh, for citizens to the internet and to information is a principle worth advocating for and fighting for around the world. Uh, and I, I was happy to be able to do it there and look forward to doing it again in many other places. Um, commercial spyware, the uh, look, the, um, the, the technology horse is out of the barn on this one. I think it's very hard to uh, regulate from a technology standpoint. Uh, and so it requires policy action. Um, I think you've, you know there's a, uh, an EO um, coming. Um, and, uh, I think this is going to be one of the, uh, one of the cornerstones of, uh, of this, this, uh, year for the United States chairing the FOC. Um, just in closing, um, I'll reiterate one point I tried to make at the beginning. I just don't want us to lose sight of it. Uh, everything we say and think on this topic must not be strictly competitive or anti. Um, uh, Margaret Vestager at the, at the EU said this very well recently. She said, we have to like each other, not only because we both hate the third guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th there's, a, there's a real place here for a positive, affirmative vision for the benefits of a shared technology future uh, and attracting uh, any country uh, to join us um, in, in uh, supporting uh, a, a connected world that respects human rights and freedom. So thank you. Just make the briefest uh, closing remarks uh, because I, I think we're all interested in Ambassador Fick's views as a policymaker on the policy. Um, the, my journalistic observation is what a difference um, it, it makes to have somebody uh, of Ambassador Fick's stature um, and experience um, in this position. Uh, several years ago, the United States was simply uh, not in this game. Uh, and um, obviously, from everything you've heard from him, uh, we are, and, uh, and, and that's good. I just, I just hope that you'll continue to have support across the government. These, these initiatives start off great, and then, and then we all have seen historically how they bog down. So, you know, we'll, we'll be watching, and if, you, if we think you're bogging down, we'll be on your back. Yeah, and I, I thank you both. This has been a tour de force, and uh, hopefully 
we'll be able to um, fill in for all the you know issues that we didn't get it to um, in depth with future events here at the Freedom Online Coalition. And I think we'll we'll need to devote a, an, another um, episode to. And as I said, we'll be doing a lot of work. But on David's point, I think the fact that you have such a, a big crowd here. Um, the fact that we run out of time when there are still so many questions just says that there's so much hunger uh, for someone of your um, to, to take the leadership role that you're taking. And there's uh, so much such a well of support for everything you're doing. And I know we here at the German Marshall Fund really want to be uh, that kind of support. So thank you both. I, I Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists.